the purpose of what I, uh, my introduction here is to give you a little bit of background on the program, give you a uh, background on some of the market characteristics, some of the things that we're measuring, some of the things that we're finding in the market right now with green building. A lot of what we're finding is based on in King County because that's where the bulk of, we're a two county program, King and Snohomish counties, and since there's not a lot of certification happening up here, uh, most of our metrics are based on King County stats, and that's just a necessary evil because uh, there isn't enough up here to measure right now, and that's a big thing, one of the things that we want to change. So first and foremost, we're a green building program. It's a, it's a, it's a checklist-based program where a series of decisions in a building project can lower the environmental impact of that project and thereby make it a greener project. And so we're a rating system specifically for residential construction, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what the certification products we offer are through this presentation. In addition to being a certification program, which is our primary function, we're also an education program. We educate the building and design community, subcontractors, material suppliers, manufacturers on green building practices and how to apply our program to, uh, um, how, to how to make it happen on the ground, um, what, how you go through the certification process and what types of strategies you do in a project. I'm not going to go into much depth on the strategies. I think probably most of you are pretty familiar at this point with what different green building strategies look like. I'll go into that pretty shallow depth, um, but a lot of our education is around how to use the certification program, how to market certification, and that sort of thing. And finally, we're an association of builders, designers, realtors, anybody related to the construction industry that wants to identify themselves as being sustainability focused will be a member of ours and therefore be on our website and be in our case studies and that sort of thing so that we can develop a community around um, green building practitioners and the support of those practitioners. In terms of our funding, we are, our funding is primarily actually from certification and from membership, but we also have community partnerships with both King County and Snohomish counties. We have Puget Sound Energy as one of our long-standing and primary sponsors of the program. They've been hugely supportive over the duration of our 14-year history, and um, obviously we're a program of the master builders, so we work very closely with the master builders and their and master builders membership. Even though Bill Green's membership is somewhat unique, they overlap a tremendous amount because we're um, a program of that uh, of that organization. There are Bill Green programs all around Washington. Our program specifically is for King and Snohomish counties, but there's another program for Skagit, another program for Whatcom, another program for the Olympia area, for Pierce. Uh, there are, I want to say, 12 or 14 of them all around the state in various levels of activity. <coughs> And we recently, this past year, launched a statewide checklist for residential single-family construction so that no matter what county you're building in, you're building under the same checklist all throughout the state. That's only for single-family. Our multifamily remodel checklists are still unique to each of those respective counties, but at least we've homogenized the single-family one. Give you a little bit of a snapshot of our history in terms of membership and certification. We're currently, uh, this graph has now gone up, oh, it's a little bit old, sorry about that, but uh, our, at our peak we were at about 750 members in, right before and during the beginning of the recession. Throughout the recession, like many programs, we dropped uh, our membership, membership to about a low of a little over 400 and now we're back up to about 450, 470 member companies to build green currently. In terms of certification, we've certified about 15,000 unique addresses at this point. Many of those are multifamily with multiple units. So we've certified over 20,000 living units at this point in the last 14 years. And those are all in King and Snohomish counties. So to give you an idea, in King County, for example, that's between 25 and 30 percent of all new construction permits are certified through Belt Green right now. In Snohomish County, we've been maybe as high as 10 percent right before the recession. And right now, we're hovering right around zero. <laughs> Hovering. Hovering. <laughs> Gonna get that up to one any day now, maybe two, but we're working on it. Um, so I'll go into some of the consumer characteristics, and this has been true uh, kind of throughout time. What is it that, what, that people are looking for when they're talking about green building? Most folks think first of two things, energy and indoor air quality. Those are sort of the two high priorities when it comes to making green building decisions. <coughs> Uh, they're also related to sense of community, connectivity to trails, connectivity to bike paths, connectivity to public transportation, um, amenities within either short walking distance, short biking distance, short driving distance, reducing the amount of vehicle miles, um, and 
Uh, materials are on the list. Materials are a little bit lower, I think, because the consumer understanding around green building materials is still a little bit lower than what a green building practitioner's understanding of green building materials would be. But nonetheless, it's important. And I know there are a few of you in the room here that work in the green building materials sphere. And you'll know that for your clients, it is really important. We're trying hard, and a lot of other people are too, to make that become more top of mind for the consumer. But right now, the first thing they think of is still sort of that health aspect of indoor air quality, health for their family, and energy efficiency. Not even particularly around saving energy, saving money. Although, I mean, saving money is a priority for certain folks, but when they're, when they're talking about energy efficiency, a lot of people are thinking more along the lines of uh, reducing carbon emissions and climate footprint. And uh, money is a nice add, saving money is a nice add-on to that. that I'm not gonna say that's not important, but interestingly, it's not actually the primary driver a lot of the time for why people wanna save energy. We, um, so like I said, we've got 14,000 unique addresses and 20,000 living units certified in our portfolio. And that's given us the ability over the years to analyze that data in some really interesting ways. And we're one of the only programs in the country that's been able to do that because of the, m most folks don't have a portfolio that's big enough to pull statistically relevant data that you can p actually pare down to comparable data sets. So you know, you'll have maybe a thousand addresses, but those locations, geography, building types, demographic uh, price points are all over the board, and you can't get one specific pool that's big enough to still be statistically relevant. With 14,000 addresses and 20,000 living units, we can get all kinds of statistically relevant data. So one of the things that we did last year for the first time is um, send out surveys to that uh, a large percentage of the occupants of those built green homes and those occupants maybe moved into their home in 2002, because that's roughly when our first sort of higher volume certifications were starting, or maybe they bought it from a previous homeowner that where it was certified in 2002, or maybe they were living in a five-star property that was built last year. It was all over the board, but we got a sense of what is it, first of all, did they know they were living in a built green home? That was one of our thoughts was, we wonder, we wonder if everybody even knows. And if they do know, why did they buy a built green house? Did they buy it because it was built green? Did they buy it not because it was branded built green, but because they knew it had some sustainability related features in it, green related features? Or did they buy it, they didn't care about the greenness of it, they just happened to like the location and so it was green, so what? Um, what were the, what did they care about? And what we found was, first of all, that they, they were very happy with their homes. 89% um, were either happy or very happy. 6% uh, were unhappy, 4% were indifferent. So by the time they lived in a built green home, Pretty much everybody that was living in a built green home um, was was happy about the, I guess the, the, the question was specifically around comfort. Um, were they happy with the comfort of their home? Because that's such a, a hot button topic for builders communicating um, what energy and the, com the combination of energy and indoor air quality means for the occupant. And a lot of that's phrased around comfort. So we, we phrased the question in that way and found that every, that by and large, everybody was pretty pleased with the operation of their home and, the, and their lifestyle. And, we found that, and this gets to what I was mentioning earlier about ecological footprint, what, were, what did they care about when they were purchasing the home? 56% said they just liked the home. That doesn't mean they didn't care about the greenness of it, that just means that, you know, I'm not sure how many of you have purchased a home that you didn't really like before, but, you know, generally by the time you're buying a house, you kind of like it. So 56% uh, actually seemed like kind of a low number in that regard. One of the things that I say to, to builders about marketing green building is, nobody's gonna buy the home just because it's green. They're not gonna buy a home in a bad location or with a bad sort of fit and finish, bad quality feel, um, just because, oh, well, it doesn't meet my other basic needs, but at least it's green, so I'll buy it. Nobody's doing that. They're gonna, they're gonna look to make sure that first, it meets the quality and sort of um, style, you know, whether it be design or, or whatever, uh, that they're looking for, and then the green aspect is gonna give it a value add compared to those other homes that are in that sort of similar location, similar building type, similar design, similar, qual similar quality build, and this one's green and the other ones are not, that's where the, the, the marketability aspect comes in. So no big surprise here, 50%, 6% like their home. Some of the surprises were 39% said that they bought a green home to reduce their ecological footprint. That means that there's a pretty high level of awareness around carbon emissions and around ecological footprint out there, much higher than I would have suspected. 20% um, said to reduce their water usage, 39% said to save money. So roughly there's parity there between to reduce my ecological footprint and to save money, save energy. Those were on par with each other. 
31% said for healthier indoor air, so that basically goes along with those being sort of the top two priorities. 28% uh, because they're built better than conventional homes. And this small one is only 0.8% said they didn't even know it was built green. That, that was actually a really pleasant surprise for me because I was worried that over such a long duration of the program, and mind you, some of the builders through our history, Diane would know this, some of them have done really good jobs about marketing the fact that the home was built green or green at all. Some builders have not done a very good job of talking about that when the home has gone to be sold. In our, in our earlier history, there would be a lot of homes that were green. The homeowner, th I thought, they'd buy, they'd buy it, they might never even know it. So I was happy to find that only 0.8% didn't know they were living in a built green home. We asked them, what do you associate with built green? Or in a more general sense, what do you associate with green building? 91% said energy efficiency. That was the first thing they thought of. You know, when you think just sort of scattershot. Think of, what's the first thing you think of when you think green building? Energy efficiency. Then, a greener lifestyle. That gets to that sort of connectivity standpoint. The way they live outside of just the home they live in. Do they drive an um, alternative fuel vehicle? Do they purchase organic foods? Do they uh, you know, care about the environment? Do they spend time outdoors? Greener lifestyle, that lifestyle element is an important part of it. Better indoor air quality is 45%. Water savings is 45%. Better quality was 34%, and I was happy to see that because there was a study, and granted this is a little bit old now, but there was a study done maybe six, seven, eight years ago with the Denver Built Green Program, and they actually found that the perception in the general consumer mindset in the Denver area was that green building was um, synonymous with lower quality. And we know in, in, in sort of building science for, that that's not true, but that was the consumer mindset around that in Denver. And I thought, gosh, if that's the case here, we're in big trouble. And I was glad to find that it wasn't the case. I think that that sentiment was coming from some of those early green building products, like the paints and things that, you know, in, the, in their first iteration they came out and they didn't really work very well. And they, weren't, they, they thought, oh, well, this is a newer experimental kind of construction, so it must be lower quality than traditional construction. The correlation in the consumer mindset here in the Puget Sound is that green building is sort of synonymous with higher quality, and I think that's really a lot um, more along the lines of what we see on the ground. 26% they wanted to do it because they felt like it was a good thing to do, a good deed, um, which was interesting. That speaks to that altruism a little bit. Now, that was just the, that was a study of our of who we already knew that lived in built green homes, and that was built green communicating with them. This was a different study that we uh, commissioned <coughs> four or five years ago to look at to the general population within the Puget Sound. And this was not just the Seattle area, not just King County. This included pretty much equal distribution by percentage from Snohomish County, King County, and Pierce County, actually. And um, the reason we did this was <coughs> early studies uh, in sort of the inception of our program showed that about 30% of people were in this class, not class, but in this group called the Cultural Creatives, which many of us have heard of. And that was the group that made purchasing decisions about around environmental, moral, and ethical values. And that was about 30% of people would make green building decision or green purchasing decision in any sector if it was paired with something else that wasn't green. And I thought, well, gosh, in, two, in about 2007, green building really kind of entered the mainstream and popular mindset, and a lot more people knew about it, particularly in this region. And I wondered, well, what does that mean for people that want to make green purchasing decisions in the Puget Sound compared to, say, the country on, on average? So we surveyed 430 Puget Sound homeowners equally distributed geographically. It represented not a representative example of the overall population, but a representative example of the typical home buyer population. 74% college educated, 55% female, 75% married, median age 50. Um, so maybe a little bit older than what you think of as your typical green consumer, but you know, definitely right in there with your typical home buyer type profile. And what we found was that sometime between, say, 2003 and 2008, um, the number f went from about 30% of people who would make buying decisions that were green, given parity, to 72%. And 17% felt moderately positive about green building, but it wasn't a really big factor for them. 72% said it was a really big factor. That's a huge number. That's almost getting, up, getting close to, you know, I want a quality house. How many people would say, I want a quality house? Almost everybody. How many people would say location's important? Everybody. How many people would say green's important? 72%. That was pretty eye-opening. And 72% plus that 17 brings it up to that 89% number again. That seems to keep coming up. Um, that were favorable. Fa either, either really gung-ho or gung-ho plus um, pretty favorable. 
Only 11% said, no, it doesn't factor in for me at all. Um, simultaneously, and this is again, I'm switching back and forth between some studies here. Simultaneously, uh, McGraw-Hill, which is a national construction publication, was uh, doing a study on the green building market in general. And what they were finding, and this was done in 2012, so what they were finding was between 2005 and 2011, the overall green building market in the United States had grown from six billion in overall value uh, to 17 billion. And they were expecting it to go to 20, 30, uh, 32 to 36 billion by 2013. And mind you, this study is done already as the recession, sort of barely crawling out, or crawling out of the recession. So this isn't pre-recession where these numbers were delayed three, four, five years like a lot of other things were when they were studied in 2007, 2008. And they were expecting that by 2016, two years from now, that the overall green building market, and this is commercial plus, re plus residential, uh, was going to be between 87 and 114 billion. And from what I'm seeing, at least in this market, and, and nationally, we're right along that track. I think they were pretty on target with those numbers. We're seeing significant growth nationally. I want to see significant growth now in Stonehenge County. But that's national numbers. Um, that, that, now, that's a, lo a lot of that is based on sort of surveys, what people say they, they'll do, or what people say they want. Um, that can be skewed by wanting to represent themselves in, the mo in their most favorable light. One of the things that can't be skewed is real purchasing data based on either King County Assessor's data, which we've looked at, or based on um, MLS data, which we've also looked at. And the, number, the, the stories that both of those data sets are telling compared to our address portfolio is the same, and that is that green building it doesn't all, always carry higher value than non-green building, but on average in the overall market over time, green building carries higher value in the market than uh, non-green building, and that's no big surprise because, as we've seen, a lot of people have that as a characteristic that they feel is important in their buying decisions. Those same that same homeowner group or home or potential homeowner group, the 430 that we surveyed in the Puget Sound, said that they roughly thought that green building would be more valuable by about eight to 12 percent. They thought it'd be eight to 12 percent more expensive. They'd pay eight to 12 percent more for it. That sort of thing. And what we've seen in real market data bears that out at about that exact same percentage. Yeah? Eric, Jamie Creek with Synergy Construction. Um, have you done a study on multifamily as far as how they look at people wanting to be in a green building rather than? We haven't looked at multifamily yet because our data set in multifamily isn't big enough yet to be statistically relevant. We will be because over the, over the last year or two, and you'll see our multifamily numbers, how they've jumped in, in a couple slides here. We're starting to be able, I think, to be able to analyze that. Uh, un until now, we haven't really been able to have enough projects to tell a, we could tell a story. I'm just not 100% sure it would be an accurate story yet. Question? Yeah. So you mentioned your survey, people said that they would spend 8 to 12% more because they see the dog in it. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that you can actually confirm that people have done that? That's what, yeah, that's what this slide and the next slide is. So. Um, what you'll see here is that the, green, the, the blue bars are overall market percentage. That shows that we're between 20 and 30 percent in overall market portfolio in King County. The green line is uh, price difference between green building and non-green building. So what you'll see here is the, if you were going to take a mean line, it goes all over the board, but it would be, is there a laser pointer on here? There it is. It would be right about here at 20,000 to 25,000 range if you were to average that out. And that, that would show that over time, on average, green building is, is selling for more than non-green building by in that 8 to 12% range. The next slide will be a little more specific on that. The red line is non-green construction. The green line is green construction. And if you look at where, where the red line is higher than the green line, places like here, 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 there were only, I think, six months in this 2007 to 2012, Six, six or seven months in this five-year period, the green building failed to outperform non-green building on price. And what that means is this can be all this can be for any number of reasons, and that's why I talk about it in aggregate data. Um, this could be for any number of reasons because you might have a couple months where green building products hit the market that don't sell for whatever reason. Maybe they were green, but they were in a bad location. Maybe they were bad design. Who knows? I mean, you could have anomalies in any given month. That's why I like to look at this over a whole year, over a five year span, whatever, to get a trend, to kind of a trend in mind. This isn't meant to say green building always outperforms non-green building. On any given project, it very well may not for any number of reasons. But you know, overall average data, 
countywide and actually citywide. We've looked at City of Seattle and we've looked at King County excluding City of Seattle. And Ben's going to talk about this. I think Ben's on one of your panels more uh, later today. And he has a lot more, a better handle on this data than I do because he's the one who did a lot of these studies. Uh, he'll know a little bit more about Snohomish County specifically as well. But what we've seen in the city of Seattle is that 8 to 12% pretty consistently. What we've seen in King County is more in the 3 to 5% range, but those homes are also smaller on average, so price per square foot is actually higher. It's maybe in the, as high as 20% price premium on, uh, in King County based on square foot size. But even for a smaller house, it's carrying on parity 3 to 5% more over time than non-green. That's your question well, that's a little bit. Where I was going, if you're saying twenty or twenty-five thousand, and then you go with you know, maybe a house for four twenty-five or four fifty, that's not eight or twenty percent. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, I'm going I'm going back and forth here on a lot of numbers and speaking in generalities. Ben will be able to get into more specifics for you. And if we really wanted to sit down and, and crunch some of this, these numbers, um, what we could do that. I'm just sort of going through what we're seeing as averages over time. So in terms of our certification product, and I'm going to move through this pretty quickly because I know I'm about out of time here. Um, we've got certification products for single family and townhome, for remodel, for multifamily, and for communities. Historically, single family and single family detached was our, the bulk of our portfolio. As construction, the construction type changed through the recession, we're now seeing a lot more in townhome construction and fill development. And that's not just in Seattle. I mean, I'm talking about throughout King County. Um, we're also seeing a lot more multifamily construction. In about 2008, our portfolio jumped to equal, basically, single family to multifamily. Um, and now, I would say, in any given year, our, if you look at living units, our multifamily probably exceeds our single family in a lot of cases. Just because over the past few years, that's a lot of what's been built, you know, our, apartment, our, our apartment buildings. This is roughly what the checklist looks like. It's a spreadsheet. You can go through it line item by line item. There's about 800 given decisions on any one of these checklists that you might make. Some of them are going to be as simple as use urea formaldehyde free trim. I know there's a, there was a tr uh, trim and millwork person in here, which is why I use that example. It might be flash your windows properly. Not hard stuff to do. In fact, if you're building a quality home, you're already doing a lot of these things. Um, all the way through to some of the more complex things, like if you're doing a multifamily building, having dedicated car share vehicle spots and vehicle charging stations, having green roofs on your home, um, doing rain gardens on your property to get water percolation. And so there's a lot of, there's, there's aggressive strategies and there's non-aggressive strategies and there's also, mul mul also multiple different levels of green building. <coughs> on that checklist you'll find there's three star projects, four star projects, five star projects. A three star project's gonna be better than code, but maybe not a demonstration project type of green building strategies employed in that project. In, um, a uh, five-star project, you're going to be getting up a lot to, to much more uh, aggressive green building strategies. And you're also going to start the four and five-star projects are going to hit, actually, sorry, all of them now are going to hit energy minimums. Three-star projects under our new checklist are a minimum of 15% better than Washington State Energy Code. Four-star is 20% better. Five-star is 30% better. Emerald Star, which is a sort, of, a sort of an aspirational certification level, that's where you're really going to see that demonstration caliber project. Those are going to be zero energy, uh, zero net energy on an annual basis. 70% water um, or water use reduction in the home, which basically requires a home to use either uh, gray water or um, uh, rainwater storage systems. In terms of certification process, you fill out the checklist. You hire your third party ver or you hire your third party verifier first. Fill out your checklist. Turn it into us. Draft. That's the enrollment. Fill out the checklist as you build the project. Give us a final checklist of project completion. The verifier gives us verification documents at the end. We review it. You get your certificate. You can say this is a Bill Green certified project. You can list it on the multiple listing service as a Bill Green certified project. <coughs> if it's a custom home, if it's a remodel, your client can list it when they go to sell it sometime down the road, hopefully getting them some sales advantage over their peers when they go to sell that home. That's how we market it to um, remodel and custom buyers. They, are, they don't need to get a certification for their own peace of mind. They're working specifically with their builder. They know what they did. They know what their priorities are. They had a direct hand in making those decisions. 
But they don't need to know that there's a certification. They need to know it's green if that's what they care about. But the reason they want to take that next step to get a certification is if and when they go to sell that home, they want to be able to market it, market those things they did. And they might have a green home all day long. They can't market it really as a certified home unless they certify it. So if they did all the things anyway, you might as well get it certified because that might give them a sales advantage at some point down the road. Um, if you want to know where green buildings exist, go ahead, Scott. Aaron, uh, so the third-party verification is required for three, four, and five stories? Yeah, three, third-party verification is now required for all projects, uh, all, on all checklists. Um, if you want to know where green buildings exist, and this might be, I haven't actually looked at Snohomish County lately, it might be interesting to take a look at this. If you want to know how many are in your neighborhood, how many are in the neighborhood you're about to build in, how many are in the neighborhood you want to move to, take a look at our online map. It's at our website, builtgreen.net. We have all 14,000 of those unique addresses listed on the website, and you can zoom in, zoom out, however you want to do it, uh, for, for our neighborhood to see how many homes are green, what star levels they are, who built them, what year they were built. There's a lot of interesting information on there to figure out where uh, built green properties are. Um, skip some projects. Just to go through that Emerald Star certification I mentioned, there are a lot of rigorous environmental benchmarks to get to that uh, demonstration caliber project like Z-Home. Z-Home is a uh, 10 unit zero energy townhome project that was built in Issaquah. I know many of you have already been to, been to see it. We operate a stewardship center there, which is one of those 10 units. We will until 2016. So if you have not had an opportunity to see one of the most groundbreaking green building projects in the country and want to, let us know. We can facilitate a tour for you or a site visit. It's a really neat project. Finally, um, the question that we get a lot asked by, I know there are a lot of public sector folks here in the, in the room, is, okay, that's great. It gives builders a marketing advantage maybe. It gives buyers a sense of confidence around meeting their values. That's all good. How do we know it's really working? What kind of environmental savings are we talking about on the ground? Is this really making a difference in terms of, say, carbon emissions, in terms of water um, use reduction, in terms of water infiltration into sites? And so this is a study that the city of Seattle has done over multiple years with our, um, using our, our, our address list to compare to the checklist that were filled out and the strategies that were employed on those projects. And what they found was, again, this is, a lot of this is modeled uh, because it's very, very, very difficult to do actual use monitoring on sites. Very expensive, has privacy issues. Um, so a lot of this is modeled, but I would say that they did a lot of, uh, of work in making this accurately modeled. What they found is based on, now mind you, I said there were 800 items in the checklist. This is based only on these eight or nine items that they were easily, easily modelable and measurable uh, within this, with, that were related to water conservation. And what they found was that an average built green home saves about 15% over a code home on water. And that over our entire portfolio, and mind you, this is the entire portfolio of city of Seattle within this two to three year time range, not the entire 14,000 portfolio. So you can multiply these numbers out significantly, and that really shows how much volume has an impact on savings. Within the small that within about 500 homes of that 14,000, they were saving 2.5 million gallons a year in aggregate. Um, over the same uh, over the same number of homes built in King and Snohomish counties during that same three-year time frame, that would be about 10 million gallons saved per year, and that's ongoing savings. Um, in terms of th these three credit items only related to water <coughs> infiltration, they were saving 30%, 37% or they were infiltrating 37% more water than a code at home, equating to about 1.3 million gallons per year for those 500 homes. And that's, um, there's actually a, a lot more than that that's, that's not measurable. If you look at maybe the 20 or 30 credit items that are related specifically to per infiltration, these were the three that they felt that they could confidently measure. On um, for United Recycling, I know is in the room. Uh, those homes are diverting about 568 tons of recyclable material from landfills to recycling facilities. Uh, so that'd be about 2,000 tons, a little bit over 2,000 tons in King County over the, or in Snohomish County over that same time frame. And the big one in terms of carbon emissions, which I know a lot of our public sector jurisdictions are looking at, is those homes are saving about 15% on average um, on uh, energy conservation, which equates to about, for Seattle, 1.3 million kilowatt hours saved per year ongoing, 5.3 million kilowatt hours saved in King and, Snohom King and Snohomish counties during that time. Again, that's only a three-year segment. That's only about 
10% of our total portfolio that's, that's performing like that. The rest of it you could multiply out by say, I don't know what the number is, another, uh, multiply that by 10 more. Um, and that equates to about 3,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide reduction every year from both being homes. So that's pretty exciting. And that, because I'm out of time, is the end. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. How are you? Glad you could all make it so early. I'm warming up a little bit out there, so not so cold in the morning. Uh, I'm Tom Campbell from the Clearwater Commons, and I want to take you through a bit of an odyssey, a little bit of a story that some of you may know a little bit about, but the process that I've gone through to create a program, which we did not get certified, but if there's this deal here, I might want to go get certified <laughs> after this, and I, I really appreciate that presentation because I think it really starts to zero down on what are the real net benefits from building green and you can start identifying and marketing that, which I think is a really important component of it, which I'll talk about. So I want to just run through what I think, and I have a different history. I'm not just a builder or a developer. I'm actually a policy wonk, a turn developer and builder. And so I want to share some thoughts about some of the challenges that we have generally with development that are kind of fit the planning and urban landscape. I'm going to set all this within the context of uh, Clearwater Commons and the process we've gone through with that, showing you about site planning and low impact development. Randy Slate will kind of work more directly on the LID components, which are, I think, a really important component of also built green. Some of the sustainable building elements that we put into it and the stream restoration and environmental values that we put into it and some what I think are some messaging issues that we have with sustainable development if we are to market it further. So my odyssey, and I, I spoke a couple weeks ago in Olympia, and it was called a Vision to Action Conference. But my sense was, is more what are the dreams we have and how do we make them real? Or sort of a dreams to reality. My history is that I wrote much of the state's growth management act. I'm a board member and judge for the state's smart growth program. I was on the Governor's Land Use Study Commission. I spent 14 years in Olympia working on developing some of these policies. And one of the key components that we struggled with back in the 90s when things were developing so quickly was how do we manage transportation? How do we manage the costs that go along with development? And there was a seminal study back there in the 70s called the cost of sprawl. So it started measuring, as kind of Bill Green did, what the costs are if you continue this pattern of development across the landscape that continues to leapfrog. So I with Senator McCann, well, spent much of my life working on how do we make more livable communities, denser development, and make that a process that works on a regulatory scheme. But what was interesting for me about the Clearwater Commons is here I was trying to permit a project, get it through the process, through laws that I helped to write. So I'm sitting across the permit counter <laughs> looking at Oh, concurrency. How do we deal with that? How are we going to get measured with the more units we have as opposed to some street down the road? And as we were implementing the Growth Management Act, you had all these other rules. You already had SEPA, you had the Shoreline Management Act, then you had the Growth Management Act, then you had the Endangered Species Act, now you have LID. You have all these different conflicting, <laughs> sometimes, rules that make it difficult to really make this process work smoothly. It's not that somebody could wave a magic wand and make it work smoothly, because I think many of the people in our departments are working their very, very best to make it work. But there are many issues that come up with what are the incentives to really build green, to have a more sustainable development process, and the like. And not only that, but we really have to start then zeroing in, as this proposal did, this presentation did, on the long-term costs and benefits, and really the overarching issue of climate change. So I'm going to give you this little six-year odyssey, and I'll set some of those kinds of rules and issues that we had to deal with in the context. And I not, don't want to do it just based on kind of how we built green, because we did a much larger project than that. And it was a six-year odyssey, really, to use a very, which I think is a challenge to all of us, if you're looking at infill and urban growth uh, densities, how do you build in more challenging sites? So there is, I think, a real need to begin to think about some of those marginal lands as you start seeing some of the short plats that are going up that are just, it's an amazing amount of development. I don't even know how the building department is coping with this stuff. 
but the ma amazing amount of development that's going on on land that's already been short platted since the recession, but now I think we still have some of these properties that are far more difficult. So our, our project was to build 16 units. Um, we bordered North Creek, so we had all the endangered salmon rules, um, and we worked really to kind of shoot the moon, to come up with a comprehensive low impact development project that would really be, I think, a model for how one could do it. So not only were we trying to look at um, creating a livable community, but we wanted to share these kind of goals. We had a community design process to create wildlife habitat by restoring the creek and the wetlands, be a place where you could do community education, create a more pedestrian friendly. Some people look at it as kind of a co-housing, but we don't really see ourselves as co-housing model. We are in the legal structure of condominium development, which I think is a very problematic legal structure, but it's a way to do something a little bit denser. Um, we're very focused on how could we conserve energy, and we looked across the whole thing from geothermal. We were able to do some of these elements. We worked very hard at looking at the local products, the recycled industry, how could we bring those into each of our units, um, and, and really look at those best practices for, for a low impact development. So this is our site plan. Um, it's just, this is a wetland on the north side. This is North Creek right here. Um, so all of this is wetland and in the native growth protection area. So we got a 2.3 acre area that was buildable. If you were looking at me, it's still marginal. It's still, you know, we've been able to, as I live on this property, notice as things change, to what extent, where does the groundwater go? How does it move? You really have a, a much better sense of the process by which when you, what the effect is of creating building. And you'll see kind of the types of building um, that we've done based on this site. So our low impact development considerations, and I think it's really a critical component, is that the design stage is really uh, important. So you saw our development goals. Um, those were things that we thought were really important. But when you're looking at low-impact development, you're really looking at how do I conserve every natural area, those significant trees? How do I minimize site disturbance, impervious coverage? And disconnecting those so there are ways in which that water is able to infiltrate um, in order to really help, to the extent possible, maintain site hydrology. So these are some of the, all the methods that we use in it. So you can kind of look through the, the list of things that we did um, as we went through it. I will say that starting out, we really wanted to shoot the moon on everything being pervious and having pervious uh, sidewalks and everything like that. But when we started looking at the costs, um, we really had to get more realistic. We also had to deal with some of the restrictions of the fire department so that you had to have wider roads than perhaps we would like to have done. But we tried very hard to see, after we started this, how do we then do some value engineering over how many of these elements could we really accomplish and still maintain uh, a reasonable price point on the homes. So I'm just gonna run through a few of these so you see what we did on site. Um, this is a, a rain garden or a bioretention facility as they're now called if they're engineered um, that's in the public right of way. This was an issue that we had which was a deviation from uh, existing county standards that we had to get approval for. You might see this little sign here that says rain garden, do not mow. There's a little issue here around how do you maintain rain gardens in the right of way and who's responsible for that. One day the county mower was out there and they flattened it um, <laughs> all the way down and I couldn't get out there fast enough and they, a lot of our mitigation was just like, are you kidding? You know, those were the willows we planted, or these were the wonderful plants we put in. Luckily, a lot of these plants were pretty. We had to do some work on it, but, you know, we were able to reinvigorate it. So it was like one hand has to be able to talk to the other hand. And I think the county's pretty aware of that now. This was a, a rain a green retaining wall that we did that the county road engineer was able to approve. So it allows for uh, infiltration and for the wetland on the other side to kind of move through it into this side of the wetland. It's called Delta Lock, which um, I'm still having to go replant a little bit on it because it needs some more willows around it. It has a little bit of exposure to the sun and some of that 
is important to be able to keep it green. This is our pervious concrete um, in the parking lot. This is that mitigation area. Um, I will say one little story here is that we did go down on my knee to the county engineer to figure out could we make this road 18 feet instead of 20 feet because at 20 feet, at 18 feet I wasn't going to go into the wetlands but we had to, in terms of the design, we had to come up with, and maybe I go back, we had to have a place where if somebody drove their car over the edge that they wouldn't flip into the wetland so that extra two feet of a buffer put me into a Corps of Engineers permit. I was 81 square feet into a wetland that required a Corps of Engineers permit that took me a year and a half to get. <clears throat> so um, another element, and this is uh, always a design issue, is the fire lane. So this is a 20 foot wide fire lane. That parking lot that you saw up there has the um, a hammerhead turnaround in it so that we didn't have to create that cul-de-sac. So this is a product called drivable grass that I searched for quite a bit. Grass paved too is a plastic cut thing that I didn't really like. Um, and this is recyclable concrete and it's two foot by sections. Um, and the pervious concrete that we have up there still takes a lot more maintenance than this. And I kind of like this product better, but there's always a need for innovation in the product development for the kinds of previous things that have some aesthetics, but and are also not so hard to maintain. This is that previous path that we had through the site, um, the, the uh, fire lanes up here. So we use pin foundations you saw on our uh, list, and this is we are probably one of the few full developments that are based on using pin foundations. This was our first attempt at putting in pin foundations. And if you go to the LID demonstration center at Puyallup, you go out there and you have a 60 pound hammer and you put them in and they're, no problem. So for us, it took a lot of work to figure out how to do these easily. I think they're more cost effective and you'll see some of the pictures as to how we developed them. But this is really, really rocky soils. I mean, you could go to the gravel pit and find these kinds of soils <coughs> underneath the top soil. So we had to get a major air hammer, 90 pound, and after we figured it out, we were able to drive them through. So I want to just quickly shift to the building side of, of the equation. Um, these were the elements that we used, um, advanced framing at two foot centers. We had a blower deck, tor door, can't speak tonight. The door test score at 1.9. Um, they all have wire for solar PV and hot water, blown in and bat insulation, metal roofs, pin based compact fluorescent lighting, all non toxic finishes, energy star. We had a rain screen on the outside um, with rigid insulation, um, cloth windows and outlets, stormwater infiltration trenches, and an energy recovery ventilator. So I want to just give you a couple shots on building the darn things in the winter. <laughs> so these are those pin foundations, but laying, laying the foundation when you're really doing minimum site excavation, you know, we, this is not one of those cut and scrape kinds of projects. You really maintain as much as you can of the site as, as, as you can go with it. But it makes it a little muddier, you know, <laughs> you, have to, you have to deal with some things. This was the platform. These are smaller homes. so. Um, our largest one is uh, 1,800 square feet. We have three bedrooms at 1,600 and two bedrooms at 1,300 square feet. This is going up with our friends. This is a, a finished home at 1,800 square feet, noticing the pin foundation. So this one is a little bit more challenging because it's on a slope. Um, so you had to do a lot more bracing. I'm just about ready to build another unit and we're looking at different ways of doing some sheathing down the side to make it a little um, less expensive and, and not such big pins. But I have to do a little bit more engineering to get there. This is the duplex that we built. Um, nice little rain chain. The infiltration trenches are on the side as well as here. Infiltration trench alongside. 
This was the old uh, farmhouse I remodeled with a very green remodel, solar hot water, green little porch roof there. Um, all green finishes, as much recycled materials inside, took materials from an old gym up in Darrington, um, put it in. We have a 9.2 kilowatt photovoltaic system uh, with a charging station on it. So um, this is all in state uh, built, so through Western Solar and iTech up in Bellingham. So we get the full 54 cents. It's a great long play for investments if you're going to be there for 10 years. <laughs> After six or seven years, it starts to pay for itself. I get a $5,000 check every year. I love it. <laughs> This is a very cool house that we have on the property. It's a certified passive house that was built by uh, South Seattle Community College students, designed by Joe Giampetro. Um, it's our little guest house, but it has foot thick walls. You can see this blower test um, at 0.38. It was one of the first certified passive houses in the state, um, and is really a joy to live in. Very quiet, has a heat recovery ventilator, um, and a very cool little place, 300 square feet. So the, I want to just kind of jump back for a minute because we're going to talk about low impact development stuff as well. So this is our property during a major flood event. So the, this is North Creek, and if you think about North Creek, and anybody knows where North Creek goes, its headwaters are in the Ever Mall. So when it floods and it rains here, it gets hammered. This is a five-star spawning place for salmon. So for them to survive an event like this, Little Bear Creek is much less built on. It, when it gets a big rain event, it doesn't get hammered nearly as much. In fact, it kind of comes up and goes down much more slowly. But North Creek gets hit very, very hard. So it, in partnership with the county and the state salmon recovery funding board, we worked um, to create a whole stream restoration project from putting large woody debris, in, we created back channels for the flooding. This is a, a fairly big event with no flooding on it because there's a back channel now, there's places for salmon to spawn. This is one of those back channels that reduce flooding um, and create spawning areas. For those of you who don't know, Chinook need to stay in the creek for a year. They don't just spawn and run down the creek in the Lake Washington and out they stay for a year. So that's one of the more challenging parts of an urban stream is for them to be able to survive within that environment. So to tell you, this is kind of what we look for. This is the Chinook, this um, about September, spawning out here in our creek. Um, that was that place that I showed you that got wiped out in that last flooding. So the stream restoration component, I think, was a, it was a really great benefit to live on. So we have kind of this waterfront property. So I've spent some time really thinking about both as a builder and a developer and somebody who tries to market this, and I think it's partly the built green aspect of it. To what extent, how do we message and sell green development? So people get the built green, they kind of get it, and we use green, yeah, it's green built. We didn't get certified, but if you tried to measure us, I bet we'd be at least above that three for sure. But I always try and say, instead of just low impact development, let's think about positive impact. So the positive savings that you get from a built green home, the positive impact of protecting watersheds, measuring that. So a buyer can come in and say, oh, I'm getting this from a local product. This is something that is keeping jobs in our community. It's creating livability. Some of the measures that you showed on why people live in that, the, the trails, the parks, and those. So supporting local sustainable products. We can measure that and you can measure the energy savings. So I usually talk a lot about low impact development and green building. This was an attempt to kind of give you the whole swath, the whole odyssey for me of trying to create a green building in a sustainable way using as much and forest certified land of building products and all the different elements that I think create a more livable community. So. I do think we need to continue to polish our messaging on what do people want when they buy green development. Is it sustainable? Is it a positive impact to the community? Is it just that it's green? Or how do you show what those net benefits are? So I would be happy to answer any questions. And I think I stay within my country. <laughs> Based on the constraints that 
to the wetlands. Yep. Because you would be able to take, you know, grade that whole area. Yep. Get the so essentially. We probably would have been able to do it if we put a big detention pond on the facility. So, but yes. Well, you would have lost a unit. Yeah. I would have lost some stuff and, and the, the soccer field would be gone. <laughs> But go ahead, sorry. But since, uh, since that development, have you uh, heard of any other developments using the Foundation? No, I think it's used in steep slopes and it's used for decks, but it's not used as frequently. Um, the place we get is a place called Pin Foundations, and he's a local guy that's engineered these. And I think the, re the regulations are now more permissible about it. But we had to do the soil geotech for it. We had to do the structural. And you know, every time I change something, I have to redo the structural for it, but our first run through as being a guinea pig on it, I think it was problematic in terms of being able to do it cost effectively. Now I know I'm in a much better shape. There are not that many builders who really know how to do it, so it's a little iffy, but I, I love the look of it. I like the experience, you know, the water infiltrates underneath it, so it maintains the whole site hydrology. I think you get a fair amount of credit for using it in terms of the stormwater handling too, so I think for certain sites it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I noticed your uh, buildings were up quite high, uh, and it seems like there'd be a lot of negatives to that. One, one is structural. You have to cross raise like crazy underneath, and then you've got um, you've got all your plumbing exposed too. So you know, it seems like there should be a compromise of some kind to get the thing down close. Well, to that the one on the slope, the one that you saw that was the duplex is about, you have to have 18 inches of clearance. Okay. So we're gonna be able to bring that down with some sheathing down the side. So there's a structural benefit to sheath down the sure, side to sure. lower it. Right. You still have to maintain that 18 inches. But um, we haven't had any issues. I was worried about the water freezing. We haven't really had, had any issues with the insulation coming up for the water. Um, so I actually kind of like the look of that. And, uh, but I have, we haven't found any, they're very buttoned up underneath mm -hmm. in terms of any, we haven't had any road issues. Um, so, and you know, they're as insulated underneath as they are um, all the way around it with rigid and stuff. So it, they're, they're pretty tight and um, you know, it's marine grade plywood <coughs> underneath, so it's all pretty good. Which, where is your uh, floor insulation in? It's all rigid underneath? Yeah, underneath. Looks very Louisiana. Does it? <laughs> well, you, you never know these days when the weather changes and climate change. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. yeah. So you said minimal. Do you still have to excavate a little land to I get to bearing soil? Uh, no. no. no you just run those right off of what you have. I have to excavate for the utilities. Yes. Well, okay. Um, and there's a process of staging for that so that you get the pins in and then you snake it through. But um, no, we maintain the, you have to really do the geotech work to understand how your soils are. So I mean, how long the pins have to be. Yeah. We didn't have to have a structural engineer out there measuring until they get to resistance. We were able to evaluate the length of the pins based on the soils themselves. So. You know, when they, these all have to be five feet, these have to be six feet. Yeah. But, you know, you're worried a little, maybe being high, you worry about that big wind and uplift. So that's why you have a good structural engineer who signs off on um, the depths. So is there one of the last question is, uh, insurance considered a post and pier house? Yes. They do, okay. Some like it. Some want, some won't insure it because it doesn't have screening yeah. or wrap around it but others will. But it's still, you know, between banks and some of the insurance industry, we still have a ways to go to no, make I sure know, the I'm just, just curious. Yeah. I like it. Oh. Yeah. Speaking of banks, <clears throat> did you have problems with appraisal or with getting lending for properties because they're pretty unique? Yes. Of course. <laughs> how, did you, how did you work through that? Or what, did you eventually find banks were willing to lend on it? Well, I'm a very persistent person. <laughs> and this is a condominium legal structure. So in order to, at the point when we made the decision to go with condominium, that was kind of a prefer, a, an easy way to go. Mm -hmm. But then with all the new banking rules, it became much more complicated. Mm -hmm. And building green in Snohomish County, it was very difficult for a 
condominium to find a comp yeah. on the price points that we have. So you had to have buyers who had a, a better um, pre-qualification and equity to make it work on the debt income ratio. Mm -hmm. But we generally were able to do that. But I'm still fighting on a few. Yeah. So if, if folks had, if you're more interested in looking at building pin foundations, do yeah. you have any kind of resources or people to point them towards? If Absolutely. Like, you know, Rick Agliano from Pin Foundations is just a tremendous guy. He's been there with us all the time. And he re-engineered, he's a certified engineer, so he can look at some of the issues that you have on site. He's kind of an evangelist on it. So I would, we would love to see it happen on a more broad scale basis. What? Just to keep being on the tin pile. You kind of beat on it if you yeah, use I it. Know, I've done a lot of it actually. But to, uh, I, I'm surprised that you're not required to have a geotech or someone on site to certify when resistance is met. Because you could do, in my experience anyway, you, you could. You, you can do that if you want to. No. But you can do it the alternate way of the engineer deciding the pin, the size and the lengths based on the geotech survey. You'd, so they'd have to do, they'd have to do test pilings, test drilling at every site then, to begin with. Well, we already, we did test geotech on each of the sites. So we okay. have data on the soils at each location. On which location. the design is based. On which the design is based. And then the structural certifies that they actually, like okay. a special inspection, that they right. met their design. Okay, so that even now we're getting later. Yeah. 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 It's less expensive than to pay an engineer to sit there as you're pounding. Right. I'm, I'm just wondering, because I've done it you know, with an engineer and without, um, but you know, generally resistance is with a 90 pound hammer, it's you know, one inch per minute. Um, but I'm just wondering, the guy that's actually driving those, those uh, pipe down and notices that it's going at you know, three or four inches per minute, but says, whoop, I've got my eight feet in. And it just seems like a lot of it is left up to the, the person doing it. Well, the they come back and inspect. We look at the layout, take pictures of yeah. the side, the lengths on each of them, and then, you know, sometimes there's a huge rock down there. It's, <laughs> well, then you've met resistance. <laughs> yeah, well, not in our book. We have to keep going. That's a little bit of a dilemma. Huh? Yeah? I'm guessing those uh, street edge alternatives and soils and rain gardens have probably made the sand a little bit happier on the more upbeat one. <laughs> and that can't be a bad thing, right? No, I think you see why I showed you that flooding slide is that we're all in this together. We really do have. Uh, the cumulative effect of uh, impervious surfaces throughout an area does have an effect directly on salmon. And so I think the work that we did in partnership with Snohomish County, I think it makes a difference. But you know, it's all, there's so many factors, right? So it's one that we can have, I think, an impact on. Another question on your, on your impervious sur surfaces, you have the, uh, the one for your fire lane, which was? Drivable grass. Okay. And then you have your so-called previous concrete. Yep. Uh, why didn't you just do the drop of grass for the entire? You know, if I had thought about it, I probably would have gone to drivable grass throughout the parking lot. I see. Because okay. I'm not a huge fan of previous concrete. It's OK, but it takes maintenance. And the top core is tends to, to yeah. come off. Yeah. Don't you have to clean it a lot? I do. Yeah. I do it twice a year. Oh, boy. <laughs> Did you have a, a drainage system under the, your uh, Pervious concrete? So the pervious concrete has a whole set of underlayment in terms of rock that creates quite a container underneath it. And if you saw that all gets then kind of filtered through the pervious concrete, it's about a foot all told between kind of the pervious concrete itself and the rock underneath. And then it slants toward our wetland area. So it gets filtered there and then goes into the wetland mitigation area. So it's a good linkage. There's no pipes. No pipes. No pipes. No pipes. All right. You got to tell me, Lisa. You got to call Last it. Last question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I heard one of your presentations before, and you spoke about the training that you do with the children that live on the site. Yeah. Could you um, summarize that a little bit? Because I think it's very charming and also very important. Yeah, so we, not only do we have kids that um, are on the site that participate in all of these, we are uh, co-located with the Clearwater School, which was started by some of our families. So the kids are all involved in stream restoration work. And they go out and do plantings. And you know, it's very different to live in a place where you're actually watching the stream restoration mature over time. So a lot of times you see these bioretention and stormwater things, they've just been planted. But if after three or four years, you really see the willows come up. But they really start leaping after three or four years. Then it becomes a whole new habitat. So it's a very exciting thing for our kids to be part of and, and really sort of enjoy both the fruit of something you were participating in and seeing it when the salmon come up. So thanks. And the yeah, today I'm going to uh, I'll go over some of the green building case studies uh, in the county and update the group on the current and proposed MPDS permit regulations as they relate to low impact development. And uh, one of the things that we've just recently done, the Washington Bill Green Checklist contains many elements for the site that meet or exceed the requirements of the planning policies and the drainage regulations of the county. But not all of them, especially the five-star requirements. Most of the five-star requirements are more, uh, more involved and uh, certainly exceed our current requirements. Um, we have updated the natural environment um, section of the GMA uh, comp plan and uh, regulations that Natural Environment Policies 1C1 has recently been updated to encourage the use of low impact development techniques and site planning strategies. Well, NPDS, as you know, is the National Pollution uh, Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, part of the Federal Clean Water Act. The Washington permits are issued by the Department of Ecology, first issued in 1995. They were modified, updated in 2007. 2012, and most recently in 2014. As you can see, that this is kind of, when we have a really complex system like this, you have to flow chart it. And this particular process is very complex. Um, and now to integrate something called LID is required where feasible in the future, uh, is gonna make it even more complex then this is the, the way the, the uh, uh, flow chart looks like for the current regulations. Some people like to see this in a hierarchical form. The uh, NPDS comes down from the federal government. Uh, the law regulates water quality through the Clean Water Act, through EPA, which has delegated their authority through the uh, Department of Ecology in this state. Uh, Idaho is is uh, under EPA itself. And then those regulations are passed on down to the county to <coughs> implement and, and uh, initiate. The uh, 2007 uh, requirements are current regulations uh, did spell out site planning requirements uh, that were codified in the stormwater site plan. And that's what Tom was uh, describing their project, he went through an extensive uh, site planning process. There were runoff controls to minimize uh, minimum requirements from 1 through uh, 12 or 10, and we had uh, that regulates for new development and redevelopment. The best management practices, site selection, and design criteria was one element of that. And the Snohomish County adopted our own uh, stormwater management manual in two th September 2010 that was deemed equivalent to the 2005 DOE manual. That's our current regulations. Now the regulatory thresholds uh, for uh, the new development, redevelopment, really haven't changed that much uh, the, uh, from the existing code, their current regulations, to what's being proposed in the uh, probably June or a little later than that just next year. 
and that's for uh, uh, projects that are less than 2,000 uh, square feet of impervious are considered small projects. Uh, if you go over to 2,000 square feet of impervious surface and above, up to 5,000, then you have to prepare a targeted drainage plan. At 5,000 square feet, you have to start doing water quality treatment. And at 7,000 square feet of clearing, uh, you are now required to get a land disturbing activity permit. Uh, that's for the clearing activity on the site. And if you've got over 10,000 square feet of impervious surface, that impervious surface could be compacted area, fully compacted or, um, or just pavement, asphalt pavement or concrete, or the building itself is considered impervious. Uh, permits are required for grading over 100 cubic yards in the county, or if you're grading zero, anything above uh, zero cubic yards in a critical area, you start crossing a creek, you're into an LDA permit. Those are the regulatory thresholds currently. Now in the future, the term impervious surface in the next iteration, uh, it will include uh, porous concrete pavement, it will include uh, walkways and, and other things that will be called a hard surface rather than an impervious surface. That's one of the differences. The uh, minimum requirement for most single family construction in the built green program, you're going to primarily be dealing with minimum requirements one through five if you're dealing with an uh, individual site or just you're doing redevelopment infill type work. Um, so you'll be do going through the site planning process, getting your site plan squared away, submitting to somebody like Jennifer over there at the counter and if you were working in Snowbridge County. You have 12 elements of a stormwater pollution prevention plan, the erosion control plan, Many of those items, if you go to your built green checklist, you will find that compliance with those requirements will actually get you stars uh, in your um, built green program. Uh, certainly you have to control your pollutants. You don't want to have any cross connections, sanitary sewer tied into the storm sewer system. We had one situation where people were taking from a restaurant and taking material outside and dumping it into the stormwater catch basins. You know, that's not, that's not cool. And so, um, also the other thing that uh, MR4, minimum requirement number four, where you're preserving the natural drainage systems and outfalls from the site, you're not to redirect drainage from one uh, direction. If it heads this way and you want to dump it this way into another drainage basin, that's not you want to keep the flow locations going the same direction. That's kind of what Tom was describing when he was saying, well, the water naturally kind of fed to that wetland on his property, and that's where it continues to go, a subsurface feeding the wetland. That's ideal for that situation. MR5, minimum requirement number five, on-site stormwater management. It's always been a requirement to try to infiltrate if possible under the new uh, or the new manual are being proposed in, in right now it's 2012, but we expect to see 2014 manual coming out pretty soon from DOE. And there's the issue of proving how you can infiltrate and how you will be able to infiltrate the, the geotechnical information will be more rigorous than in years past. One of the other things that uh, is a requirement for applicants is to analyze, well, where does the water go downstream? If I do a development, if, it, uh, if I'm putting uh, just one house in, really you're fixed on the neighbor's property. Do I impact my downspouts or am I aiming them right at the neighbor? But if you're doing a short plat or a subdivision or building a roadway, um, it gets to be a lot more involved and the DOE manual spells out how far you have to analyze uh, the, the off-site used to be a quarter mile, now it could be up to a mile or to the nearest receiving water, uh, whichever is less. One of the new things that uh, you folks out there should be aware of is the new rain garden handbook for Western Washington. Snohomish County is currently using that as a guideline when we look at uh, rain gardens. Uh, the prior iteration of this rain garden handbook, uh, there were issues in the markup, you know, that we had to deal with as a county, you know, when we look
looked at, there was errors in it. And so they corrected a lot of things. Caddy was involved in that process. And uh, one of the things that we're going to be looking at in the future, and, and we have some control and certainly input from the building and the development community, is what should the setbacks be for a rain garden to a structure? And we'll be proposing some things, uh, setbacks in the code that's coming forward. But we found that during the last iteration, for some reason, the setback regulations themselves got to be quite involved, and in fact, to the point where they required you to get a variance process to get a, a setback. And so that became a, a whole process in itself. Uh, if you just want to build a, a little storm drain system and you had to go through a variance process, it was something that was totally new. We used to do it through a modification waiver process if you went through something less and it was more administrative uh, and less time consuming. So the DOE manual had a, a certain setbacks they, that they've identified for downspout infiltration, downspout uh, a dispersion, uh, pretreatment basements. You know, these are spelled out. Certain dimensions are set up between 10 and 20 feet, depending on where you're located. But the new, uh, what we're proposing in the new code is that the, there'll be something called a separation uh, section rather than a setback section. It will likely not require the applicant to go through the variance process. Um, LID where feasible will be required. These are some illustrations of where not to put a frame garden. You know, we've got uh, channel migration areas where we've got the river cutting underneath the house. We've got uh, landslide hazard areas. A lot of the landslides we found in the coastal uh, bluff areas where people inappropriately put their storm discharges from their house right over the bluff, which in fact many times triggered the landslide. Uh, the pit piles that uh, have been used on steep slopes is an appropriate use of pit piles, and in those situations on steep slopes, the county does require a geotech verification of the bearing, and we do require on-site, uh, given the nature of the foundation, we want to make sure that the foundation itself does not move. Um, so we also have a situation of frequently flooded areas. We don't want to have rain gardens or in the floodplain. Um, one of the areas that we found with the smaller compact development houses building closer and closer together, many times we don't have enough room to put a rain guard between a structure and, and your neighbor. And what we've also found is if these aren't designed properly to infiltrate, um, they pond up and, and what we <laughs> we caught the developer do. You know, he, he was built in the process, hadn't filed the house yet, but our inspector goes out to, to look at the foundation and saw that he had a pump. He called for the inspection and there was water that was actually backing up and so he was going to pump all the water out into the street. Well, you can't do that. That's pumping it onto somebody else's property and we certainly don't want, you know, um, the water that was on your property pumped out into the right of way. Well, this, this is another um, situation uh, we, in the, both the existing manual and the new manual, there's uh, credits given in the Bill Green program for retaining existing vegetation on your site as much as possible. This, the one on the left it was a project that I worked on years ago called Forest Villa. It's over in the King County area near Highway 99. You think of Highway 99, you don't think of any trees. You think of just total pavement. But the goal was to save a forest, really. And what we uh, wanted to do was disperse the runoff through the forest. And this is an example of what could be done if you have that and that's your goal at the beginning of your site planning process. The one on the right is a flow through uh, rain garden, Mount Lake Terrace. Uh, and also use brick pavers and uh, permeable pavement uh, to allow runoff to go through the site. So, and that was a newer development in the last year or two. One of the things that, that uh, we have in Snohomish County is the, this issue that was brought up about mobile versus planted and weeded and, and bioretention systems. Um, 
county's current policy is that these flow through bioretention systems. If it's a bioretention system, it has to be an engineered system. Anything in the right of way is going to be engineered. Uh, or grass swales uh, have to be uh, maintainable. And the picture on the left showed what it looked like before. We had mud basically kind of flowing off the side of the right of way onto the pavement and being tracked. And by putting in the curb and a little bioretention system, we cleaned up the pollutants around the corner and cleaned up the pavement itself. Similar situation here on the right with a more of a different type of landscaping. Right now, the, the policy, as I said, must, must be mobile in the right of way. This is along Lake Serene, where we have a separated porous concrete walkway. Uh, separated from the pavement, and then we've got a, a mobile bio, bio uh, infiltration system along the side. And the one on the right uh, has some uh, landscaping, a little broader, flatter slopes uh, up near uh, Marysville. So we've done some cost, uh, look at the cost of what a typical bioretention facility is costing us on an annualized basis, about $15,000 a year to uh, weed, mow, um, and map uh, these facilities and mark and sign them so that they are not going to be mowed over, especially if somebody like Tom. Um, that was the first project, by the way, that that happened to, and the first one that brought our attention. Oh my, we've got to actually track these in a database to see where all these facilities are. It turns out that the newer permit makes that a requirement. Uh, to do that sort of thing where, where these uh, water quality facilities are as part of the county's NPDES permit. So road maintenance will know the location. Another new thing that is required, um, this is a picture of me out of the preserve of Meadowdale, um, that, that particular project is going to be a, a lot of single family homes, but there's a rain garden on each lot which is different than a lot of the developments that we see. And there's also, these are uh, systems that are being monitored in the right-of-way itself, but it's a private road right-of-way, not a public road right-of-way. So they have little orifice controls, and we want to make sure that you can easily pull this out and look at it and make sure that, that the orifices can be cleaned and that it's not an impossible situation. So uh, that was something that we were looking at in the field. Another thing that occurs with the development uh, of these type of projects, this is a picture of uh, Orchid Lane, which was part of the one of the early reduced drainage discharge demonstration program in Snohomish County. It was an LID project, it's up near, now been annexed to the city of Marysville. But you have to prepare a set of landscape plans, full drainage plans, and so forth to uh, get one of these projects through. And then we, of course, have to review it. This incorporated a lot of uh, swales and infiltration. Now I'd like to kind of switch topics from the NPDES to some of the green building projects. Now, I'll be talking about some commercial that don't all have the uh, built green, you know, it's more of a single family residential uh, aspect to it. But these are some nice, um, commercial and, uh, and some single family. The Still Guamish Tribal uh, Natural Resources Center, the thing I like about that project, you really should go take a look at it, it used both, uh, it, it, it was one of the sites that they went through the site planning process and those places on the site where LID was feasible, they used LID techniques like permeable pavement or permeable asphalt, rain gardens to um, drain off their uh, site and, and get the water to infiltrate. Those areas where it didn't meet the soil depth, they didn't do that. So it's a hybrid, it, but it shows that they tried to do what was necessary. Uh, and within the structure, the, the, this, this project and the one uh, after it that I'll show you, they went through in the, in the, the initial study to look at geothermal implications for the site. And do, do, it turned out that they didn't, on the uh, Valley View, they didn't do it. But this is a beautiful uh, structure that uh, C9 Design and Photography 
I took a beautiful picture of this uh, of this building where they used uh, recycled material, Corten steel. They used uh, a lot of uh, energy efficient design. M. They used permeable uh, pavers here that has a layer of sand underneath that uh, water just infiltrates. Dykeman Architects uh, had an award-winning building uh, here in the Valley View uh, site. They just recently uh, won the 2014 AIA Civic Design Award for the, their green building and environmentally uh, friendly site design. Now, many elements of the school design use green building techniques and significant site planning as well as energy efficiency. The thing, they also used um, uh, cisterns throughout their site coming down the building to recycle and reuse uh, the water internal uh, to their plumb with their plumbing system, which was different. Now, one of the other sites you talked about, uh, we were talking about porous concrete. This is a picture of the uh, Snoqualmie Gourmet ice cream concrete and uh, porous concrete lot as it was going down. Now, they didn't have to put in any detention facility and they were able to modify a single family residential home into a commercial structure, thereby saving, uh, not having to take the house to the dump. They were able to remodel that and they didn't have to put in any detention. They, everything went back into the ground and you know, all sorts of energy efficiency in that ice cream operation um, <coughs> that uh, was unique. And we talked, uh, uh, Tom talked about the Clearview Commons, uh, Clearwater Commons site planning uh, was, I think, key to the making this a success. Uh, it, the uh, narrow roadway was narrower than we normally have, but Tom's right, when you're dealing with the fire department, the 20 foot width required is the minimum requirement. But the surfaces and the, where the parking was located was different. Normally, uh, individual stalls are in front of each unit. That's not the case with this. That's different than, than other sites. So it was a unique site plan. The pit pile foundations were unique. And he's taught, we talked about that. Then we also had another, we had another different product, the grass paved product at the parking lot out of Payne Field. And that has suffered a little bit from uh, turning movements, but it's, you know, looks still working pretty good. This is our schedule. We're looking at trying to get the adoption by the middle of next year. And then uh, it may be extended slightly due to DOE not getting comments back to us, but that's what we're looking for. And that's pretty much where we're at right now. I'll entertain any questions that you might have.